What a nice way to end the day. Such a nice way. I wish I entered every room like that. Um, be awesome. So far be it for me to try to reason with networks, hmm. but The Grinder was one of the best reviewed shows of the fall. We had Rob Lowe here. He's fantastic. Fred Savage was here. He's fantastic. Uh, I know that he that Rob is on so many of the critics' best of lists for the year and for Emmy consideration. How did you guys find out the show wasn't coming back? Uh, well, uh, we found out... Five stages, seven stages of grief, right? Yeah, yeah. We found out um, right before Upfronts, which is kind of like the longest they could possibly wait. I think they were trying to make their decisions based on what they had for the season. And yeah, it's a total bummer. And you made that amazing video. Oh, yeah, I did something on Snapchat that was really stupid and fun and absurd because I had to. <laughs> I mean, why do you think, what was the explanation given to you guys? I'm just curious. Um, TV is this way. And, I, you, know, it, you know, to be fair, like, no one watched it. Like, just my mom and maybe you and some critics. <laughs> like, no one watched the show at all. So it happens. I mean, you can give a show a a chance, as they say, to have a second season and build an audience. And, and it seems that like a lot of shows get a little bit of a resurgence when they're put on Netflix after a season and people get a chance to catch up and watch them, but we didn't get that. And they, you know, it's, it's about money. That's how it works. It's TV. <laughs> you guys were a really tight cast though, right? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, we, I'm, despite everything that happened and how it ended, it was great to do 22 episodes with like really amazing people. And how hard was it looking at Rob Lowe every day? I get asked that question a lot. Um, you know, he, he does have like intensely blue eyes, but you get used to it after a while. <laughs> yeah, when he was sitting across from me, I, I was like... You couldn't make eye contact? I mean, no. I was like, I'll turn to stone if I look at you because you're so, like... Because he's Medusa? No, he's, like, the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. He's very, he's very handsome, and he's, a very, he's super funny, and it was really fun to work with him, and I would love it if he got nominated for anything. That would be great. Nominate Rob. Or Fred. Or anybody. Or the also. show. Yeah. Um, do you guys still stay in touch? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not like it's a one-off thing. No. We're all, we were all pretty tight on that show, so it's good. Yeah. And I know you've got your Emma Stone biopic coming up, Battle of the Sexes. Yes. Oh, no, that's not an Emma Stone biopic. Well, it's, a Billie it's G about Billie Jean yeah. King. That yeah. came out totally wrong. Emma Stone plays Billie Jean King, King though, yeah. so, you know, you're not it's far It's about off. the famous tennis match. Yeah. So talk to me about that. I'm so excited about it. Um, it's, about, it's about Billie Jean King playing Bobby Riggs, and it was called The, Mal uh, the Battle of the Sexes back then, and that's what the movie's called. But really, it's kind of about... Uh, everything that leads up to that match uh, for both parties. And, um, and at the time, you know, Billie Jean was fighting for equality in women's sports and just in women's pay in general. At the time, the USLTA was paying the women players 10 times less than the men. And so they started uh, their own uh, circuit, their own tennis circuit. I, I play Rosie Casals, who is uh, Billie Jean's doubles partner and one of her best friends. Uh, and her, me, my character, uh, and Billie Jean, and seven other girls, the original nine, started this tennis circuit and got kicked out of the USLTA for doing so, just to make some money and make a point that they, you know, people would go watch women's tennis and, and it could be viable. So it's about that and it's about everything that leads up to uh, Billie Jean discovering about her sexuality and then the game. And, um, and it's, it's going to be really good, I think. It's going to be really I great. mean, the pictures I saw, it's kind of uncanny how Emma Stone looks like Billie Jean King. Oh, yeah. She, she looks I would great. never, like, think yeah. in a million years. And Steve Carell plays Bobby Riggs, and he looks identical to him. And is like, so it was so fun to... And there's a great cast. I mean, it's those two, Bill Pullman, Sarah Silverman, Alan Cumming, like, all these amazing people. I think it's going to be really, really great. So did you have to learn tennis, or did you already know how to play? <laughs> no, I do not know how to play tennis, although my stepdad tried to teach me when I was really young, and I never really caught on. Um, my character, fortunately, is always either about to play tennis or has just played tennis. So it worked design. out really well for me. I, I, I learned how to act like I could hold a tennis racket and be happy that I won or upset that I lost. So you just had to be sweaty. Yeah. Which is or about hard. to be sweaty. Yeah, it's not hard for me. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> when did you first decide you wanted to be an actor? Ooh, I actually, um, 
I never really, for some reason, I mean, I, I grew up watching TV and movies. I was, um, I watched so much Nick at Night as a kid because my mom wouldn't let me watch MTV. <laughs> so I watched Nick at Night all the time and like my favorite shows were like Taxi and Bob Newhart. And, and I grew up loving this. I mean, it literally was kind of raised by TV, but I never really considered it as a career. I just, like, I didn't even think that that was like a possibility for me. I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, um, I, I wanted to go to this magnet school. I'm from Miami. It's in Florida. Uh, this high school for law, and it's a lottery, and uh, it's just random. And I and I got in surprisingly. And I was on vacation with my aunt that summer before high school started. And I got back home. I was so excited. And I went through all the paperwork, and they had spelled my name Natalia Morales. So I called, and I was like, I know school's about to start in two weeks. I just want to. Make sure that you know that my name is spelled Natalie, just so the records are good. They're like, no, we got the address wrong. The name's right. <laughs> it's a, we, we meant to get Natalia Morales. So I had to scramble, and I went to my local high school, and I didn't know anybody there, and it was summer school, and I was like, there's like a little mini summer school left, so I'm just going to take some electives and meet some people. And I took drama, and the teacher that was there and the, the kids that were in my class that year are still really close friends of mine and like changed my life forever. It was like, oh, I can make people laugh for a living and not just like at me every day? That's great. Was when good. did you realize that you could actually do this for a living? I don't think I did. <laughs> I don't think I, I think I kind of moved out to LA with a lot of bravado. I like had this plan where I was like, yeah, you know, it's gonna be fine. I, uh, Move out to LA, like a month will go by, I'll book some stuff, then like, uh, yeah, three months I should be on a TV show, it'll be fine. And that's not accurate, don't ever plan that that way, it doesn't really ever work that way, but um, I think the bravado helped, <laughs> uh, the being 20 years old helped, and I just kind of did it. I guess if you don't know any better, then you don't yeah. have to expect the worst. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked hard, you know, I worked a lot of crazy jobs and crazy hours just to support myself to be able to do what I wanted to do, and I just kind of made it happen. What was the worst job you had, or the weirdest job? Ooh, that's a great question, and I have an answer for that. Um, I sold mattresses on Craigslist. Oh my god, did you have to deal with a lot of bed bug questions? You know, that wasn't that popular back then, uh, so no, but if you can imagine, it's like a, it's like a big business. I, I didn't know this, but it's like, there's a, it's like a lot of competition. <laughs> it's really good. Wait, 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 so like new mattresses? Yeah. Or? Oh. Yeah. It's very weird. Very weird. It was a weird wow. business. Wow. Yeah. But I didn't like, ask I a mean, lot of questions. You got acting work pretty quickly, so it's not like you had to slog your way through like years and years and years of like I bad did, job. because surprisingly, acting work does not pay that much. <laughs> uh, so even if you book something, uh, like I did a few commercials my first year, and I like the first thing I did in LA that was like a, not a commercial, I did an episode of CSI Miami, which was hilarious. Um, but it, like, it doesn't pay enough to pay rent and whatever. Some commercials used to pay a lot. Commercials used to run over and over and over again. People could live off commercials. It doesn't really work that way anymore. Um, so yes, I did have to slot my way through everything. Um, but it was good. It was good. And look at you now. Yeah, I mean. with Emma Stone and Steve Carell. Yeah, it's pretty great. Not a bad deal. I can't complain. It's amazing. And I wanted to ask you, you recently wrote a really interesting op-ed. Is it op-ed? Essay? That's what they called it. Yeah, they called it an op-ed, I guess. They yeah. called it an essay op-ed. Sure. About Cuba. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that, because I know that what you wrote is so accurate. A lot of my friends are saying, like, we have to get there before, you know, before the chains move in, and before there's a Chick-fil-A on every corner, and yeah. before there's a gap. Yeah. We have to go. We have to go now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so my op-ed, I mean, the title kind of says it all. It's called, uh, Please Stop Saying You Want to Go to Cuba Before It's Ruined. Because I hear that all the time. And my family's from Cuba. I still have some family there. And like, I'm like, w ruined with what? Like, running water? Human rights? Like, what do you, like, this is a, this is a dictator-run communist country where there's no free speech. There's barely any internet. It had just started happening right now, and it's completely controlled. Their TV is completely, all their media is controlled. Their healthcare is horrific. It is, it is not what a lot of people seem to think it is. Um, yeah, a lot of people seem to think it's like very idealized. It's not, it's not. My, um, my, my mom's aunt had a, a stroke and their course of treatment was to uh, put her feet up so that the blood would rush back to her head. <laughs> 
yes, and, that's and, one way to and do they it. sent her home. My my cousin uh, had a heart attack, and they let him have bed rest in a room with a bunch of people with dengue fever. There's no there's no janitors because it pays more money to steal janitorial supplies and sell it on the street than it does to be a janitor in Cuba. So the hospital floors are filled with like feces and urine and blood. You have to bring your own sheets, your own pillows, your own mattresses sometimes, your own towels. So you don't go. My my I ha my mom. This is so crazy. So my mom had to get a prescription for syringes from her veterinarian so that she could send like a. Bo a box of 300 syringes to my, to my grandmother's sister. She has diabetes. They don't have any disposable needles there, and the needles that they do have, she'd have to go to the clinic twice a day to get her insulin shot, and it's a needle that, they, that is reused and sharpened. Oh my God. And that's the state of Cuba, and people romanticize it and fetishize it and go, ooh, all the cool cars, and... And ugh, I can't wait to the, like the people there would love a Starbucks. Like they would, you know, like that's not what job that actually yeah. pays a living wage. Yeah, it's not. It's really sort of so short-sighted. And I think people are well-intentioned, but they don't. Uh, we think of it as our own, our own vacation spot, and it really is a whole other country that's been through a lot. So I, I encourage people to go if they want to go, but just be very educated about it and help the people there. Take extra clothes with you. Give it to people that they need a lot of stuff. It's a very poor country, and it's great. Like the people are wonderful, and they're very joyous people. But it doesn't mean that their lives aren't really hard. And what you wrote about the hospital system and what was shown in Sicko, it's it's interesting. I mean, I was born in Russia when it was still communist. Yeah. And I mean, my mom told me that it like what you see on TV of the perfect yeah. totalitarian medical system does not apply to the masses. Nope. <laughs> there, three people share a bed, yes. you know, so. Exactly, exactly. I think, you know, I mean, there's a dog and pony show that the government puts on, there's propaganda, there's all those gigantic pictures of Che everywhere in Cuba. Like, Che murdered tens of thousands of Cubans and people wear those stupid shirts <laughs> and don't know that because they think it's a symbol of a uh, revolutionary and he did some good things for other countries but he was a murderer. And, and it's all propaganda, and, and, uh, and sometimes people fall for it. What do you make of all these celebrities that are now going there and uh, Instagramming everything? Yeah, that's pretty annoying. Uh, it'd be great if they were going over there to do charitable work, if they were going over there to you know, provide the people there with something, but they're going over there to like smoke cigars and pose against an old car and, uh, and have you know, some Instagram photos, and that's just sort of sad and a waste and, and it's a, uh, you know, it's using these people in this country for your own weird, weird benefit. To have nice Instagram. Yeah. No yeah. filter, right? Yeah, exactly. So what do you think people should do? Go, but spend your money sm smart? You know, going uh, contributes money to the Cuban government. And the stronger the Cuban government gets, the less strong the American people get. So if you do go, make it a research trip. Go stay with people, don't stay at a hotel. Do is try to put, uh, if, if you're asking me, try to put the least money possible in Fidel's pocket. Um, and I mean, it's a rich, beautiful country. And I, and I think, you know, if you, if you go there and you ask people what the real Cuba is like, they won't tell you because they're scared. But if you keep asking them, they might. Have you been back? I went for the first time ever with my mother um, two years ago. She hadn't been back since they were exiled, since she was 12 years old, and she hadn't seen her family in 50 years. And the only reason we went back was because uh, her aunt was really sick, and she was like, I, I really want to see her before I go. But my grandfather was a political prisoner, as are many, many people in Miami's grandfathers. <laughs> and. Um, and he never wanted us to go back. And a lot of people there, a lot of Miami Cubans are like very adamant about like, we're never gonna give money to the, the, the government. And so there's, there's a dichotomy because you miss your family and you go, it's, it's, I need to see them. I need to, you know, um, it's an interesting thing. So we went back and it was beautiful and tragic and, and, uh, and very, very interesting and very interesting for me because I grew up in the United States, but I hear all these stories and I'm, I feel sort of attached to this place, you know? Did you feel a connection when you were there? Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 sometimes I tell this story, which to me is like the perfect uh, example of how I felt there. So I was sitting in this, um, this old fort, this old Spanish fort um, that exists across from the Malecon. It's very famous in Cuba, it's, it's beautiful. 
Um, and I'm sitting on the edge of this wall, and I'm looking at the ocean and the city of Havana, and the sun is setting, and there's clouds everywhere, and I'm just like thrilled, <laughs> like just like this is the most beautiful thing. I felt such a connection to the land, and I'm sitting there, and the wind is blowing, and I'm taking a picture of everything. And my mom comes over and she goes, do you see that little yard right there? Because it's a fort. So there's like different spaces and there's a yard. And I was like, yeah. And she goes, that's where all your grandfather's friends were lined up and shot in a firing squad. And I was like, oh. And here I am like taking selfies, you know. And I, she didn't say it to be mean. She knew I didn't know. She, didn't, she was just telling me like this matter of factly, like, that's what happened here. And so it really spoke to me as far as like the disconnection I have. And even though uh, my family's from there, but... It's, it's interesting. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, and let's turn it over to the audience. Hey, Natalie. Hi. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so when it comes to auditions, like how do you uh, approach the roles that you want to take? And if you don't get the role, then how do you keep yourself motivated? Interesting. That's a great question. Um, I tend to go for roles that uh, stay away from stereotypical uh, Latina or female things. Um, I've been lucky to be able to do to play roles that are that are just people and not necessarily Latina. Um, not that I like that. That's what I want to <laughs> present in the world. I feel like there's enough devious, like <laughs> sexy maids that are going to steal your husband. <laughs> and like that's <laughs> that's a story, I'm sure. Uh, but I don't need to do it. Um, so I try to do that, and I try to do stuff that really is interesting to me. Something that I that I would watch that I feel good about. Like for example, Parks and Rec was my favorite show before I was on it. Um, and, and I was so thrilled to be on it. Same with girls and, and, a, and a bunch of opportunities that I've had. It's just like, so I, I try to look for stuff that's interesting. And when I don't get something, this is my secret. I go in, I audition, and then I forget about it. And then if it happens, it's like a great surprise. <laughs> but if it doesn't, I just try and, it wasn't for me. Next question, please. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Good. Um, I was actually gonna ask you about Girls. I love the show and I just wanted to know, I loved you on it. Um, Thank you. And I wanted to know what it was like on that set with those cast of actors. Oh man, they're so great. I'm actually, I think I'm gonna go visit them right now after I'm done with this. I'm gonna go visit set because they're so nice. I mean, Lena is a force, man. She's like, like watching her act and direct and just, I mean, she knows like, like literally every last person's name on the crew yeah. and treats them all like family and and everybody is it's a super tight knit crew and super tight knit cast and it was if sometimes when you go into a show and you're not part of it it's kind of a little odd you know it's like you're going into somebody's house and you don't really know the rules or how everybody behaves or what like the dumb like invisible hierarchy is but um, but not on that show. They were so welcoming and so wonderful, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. She is like the coolest, the nicest coolest woman ever. I know, and ever, Jenny ever, Connor ever. is like about my kid amazing. Every time I see her, yeah, like, she's yeah. amazing. Last question, please. How's it going, Natalie? Oh, hi. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm curious, like since like Fast Eight just shot in Cuba, uh, has that uh, or has in general um, have movies become more popular in Cuba? I didn't hear the first part of your question. What? Uh, I know that uh, Fast and Furious 8 oh. just shot in Cuba. Uh, so has that, or um, just the, the recent years, has that has the movie industry or the movies in general become more popular in Cuba? You know, um, I actually didn't know that. Um, but I know some TV shows that have shot there. I kind of, like, don't love watching it because of everything that I talked about. It just feels a little bit exploitative to me. Um, I don't know what that's going to be like, and I don't know what they were like to the people there. Maybe it was a great thing for the people. I, I bet it went, I bet a lot of money went to the government in that case, but I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of great Cuban movies. There's a lot of filmmakers in Cuba that make really good movies. Like, as a matter of fact, I feel like two years ago, they got invited to the Oscars because they got nominated, and everybody, all the actors came and defected, <laughs> like disappeared. Like landed at JFK and disappeared. <laughs> We're like, yes, I made a movie specifically to get out of Cuba. And um, so, I mean, they're really artistic people. They're, we are, we're, I will tell everybody this. Cubans are natural born storytellers. The shyest, mousiest Cuban will tell you a story in the best way you've ever heard. It's just how we are. We're just born that way. Um, and so, you know, the arts are really great, but I don't, uh, doing, not only like, Okay, taking movies away from here is is a problem for people that work here. But if you want something that looks like Cuba, Puerto Rico exists. It's right there and we own it. <laughs> 
Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's a mixed bag, you know? And when is Battle of the Sexes out? I actually don't know. I think sometime next year. We yeah. just, just wrapped just it. Just wrapped yeah. I know. I didn't know if they had a release date yet. Yeah, so I, I put you on either. the spot for Thank that you. one, and I yeah. apologize. Thank you so much for being Thank here, Thank you Nana. for having me. Thank you, everybody.